It's a truth universally acknowledged that things used to be good, but now they're very, very bad. This is the attractive, oversimplified narrative that structures a huge number of video essays on YouTube. The other day, I noticed a handful of videos of this type on the subject of movie posters from, among others, the content factory at Nerdstalgic. The videos I saw were all pretty much the same. You show some iconic posters from the 70s, 80s, and 90s. You throw around the name Drew Struzan. He's the guy who did posters for Back to the Future, The Thing, Blade Runner, the list goes on. You talk about how nowadays posters are soulless and generic, churned out by impersonal agencies using tired templates, and call it a day. Nerdstalgic's video ends by asking whether you can think of any great posters from the past decade. Well... Here are three fantastic posters for three phenomenal movies from just the past year. I'll explain why they're great posters in a moment, and if you haven't seen these movies, don't worry, I won't spoil them, and hopefully what I say will inspire you to check some of them out. I've chosen these posters to persuade you that while, at a glance, this gloomy tale of a long decline from vibrant posters to lifeless ones might appear true, it doesn't really work unless you only pay attention to a narrow set of blockbusters, comparing the biggest hits of the past with the biggest hits of recent years, pitting the classics against the latest entries in massive franchises. You might look at a Marvel poster and think to yourself, I feel like I've seen this poster before, which is fitting, because if you go to see the movie, you might feel like you've seen it before, too. And not necessarily in a bad way. Satisfying well-established expectations is the aim of these risk-averse franchises. And moreover, as some of the videos I'm responding to correctly point out, posters no longer serve the important function of getting you to see a movie in the first place, like they did before the internet made trailers infinitely available. Aside from reminding you what's playing at the theater, all they do is serve as decorations for your wall. I'd say they're almost more for people who've seen the movie than for people who haven't. In the posters I've chosen, you can see how some poster artists have responded to this situation when given the freedom to do interesting work. Now more than ever, a good poster often interprets the movie it advertises rather than simply presenting it, and it might not be apparent what makes the poster so good until after you see the movie. Take this poster for John Wick, Chapter 4. It's a surprisingly simple, muted image for a film that is an absolute bonanza of visual inventiveness. Only the orange light thrown across John's face from the left hints at the dazzling display of color the viewer will encounter in the movie itself. But for all its stylistic exuberance, thematically, the movie is about constraint. John is closely identified with his bulletproof suit, which he will continue to need so long as he is marked for death by the other assassins at the high table and bound by their rules, and which he desperately wants to take off and leave behind him. The oppressiveness of this identification, its inescapability, is emphasized by the extremely tight framing of the poster image and the geometric angles of the white and black of the suit as the starched collar tightly buttoned round his neck seems almost to be choking him. As he tries to find a way out, John is racing against time in more ways than one, and the poster artist has rendered his tie as an hourglass in which the grains of sand are bullets. Though John wants to make his own time as a free man, so long as he wears the suit, the only time he has is measured in gunshots, and he's fighting against what other characters in the movie keep telling him, that he'll never find peace, and carnage is all he'll know until his time on Earth is up. So while this poster might not look like much when you walk past it at the theater, it's actually a terrific condensation into a single image of what the movie is about. Have you given any thought to where this ends? Now take this poster for Tar. For this one, even if you haven't seen the movie, it should be more obvious what makes this striking poster so good. The dramatic, low-angle shot captures the imposing presence of the world-renowned conductor Lydia Tar, cutting through the negative space of the surrounding darkness as she's shown using her body to segment and master time as she leads the Berlin Philharmonic through Mahler's Fifth Symphony. We see her simultaneous assuredness and abandon, the dynamism of power radiating out from her solid torso to the rapid, blurred movements of the baton and hand, and her narcissistic and domineering personality. She's pictured as a giant who wouldn't even deign to look down on us. With her face turned away, she claims the entire space for herself, 
reaching all the way from the bottom left corner of the poster to the upper right as if to seize control of her own image, a gesture echoed by the jaunty acute accent over the A in her last name, which also titles the movie. Time is the thing. Uh -huh. Time is, is the essential piece of uh, interpretation. You cannot start without me. Then we have crimes of the future. We both changed, left our professions, and now we are what we are. Nobody saw this movie, which breaks my heart because it was easily one of the best of 2022. Granted, David Cronenberg movies are pretty freaky, so if you don't want to watch something where surgery and body horror play a big role, I get it. But it is so creative and smart and funny that it is really worth a watch if you're intrigued. The film is about the rapid evolution of the human body in response to environmental and technological changes, and how this, in turn, changes the way people relate to one another. The poster image centers the faces of the stars Viggo Mortensen, Lea Seydoux, and Kristen Stewart, fragmented by the vascular tendrils of this futuristic bed and reconstituted into a single face. The image conveys how the relationship between these characters is derived from and dependent on the changing human body and tools like the quasi-organic bed developed to accommodate and further transform it. The blurring of the line between nature and technology is also reflected in the textured red of the poster's background, which looks like it could be either the surface of some sort of manufactured fabric or the inside of someone's body. In short, the movie poster is not dead. Even at big design agencies and using digital instead of manual methods, talented artists are still making good posters. They just function differently, and more often than not, those posters are attached to the truly ambitious movies out there, which I urge everyone to seek out and watch, because we badly need more of them.